What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. What's the topic today? The practice guide to seeing the future. What in the hell does that mean? Yeah, well, hey, why not? It's just, uh, you know, the process of how do we think about stuff? Are there shortcuts? Right? So when we're looking at the stuff that goes on in our business and the stuff that goes on in, in the world, how do we see what, well, here's the obvious result, right? You know, the kind of the checkers analogy. So what's the next step? What's what's the first consequence? But more importantly for us and in any business, what's the second or third consequence? That's what we need to know. So we can see, it's almost like seeing into the future. So that was the idea of the practical guide. So just remember this question, right? If you check out and you don't remember any of the rest of the show, a good question to ask yourself about anything is ask this question and then what? And so, and then what happens? And then what happens? And you'll start to see, hey, but I see the obvious result, but what happens next, right? So you got guys like Ray Dalio writing books, and he's like, he calls it the second and third order impact. The most effective, successful business guys are looking at the consequences downstream and trying to make a decision today based on that ahead of everybody else. What do you think of that? I think I had some, I think legit my phone I had for a while, it was like, um, let me see if it's still there, but it cut off. It was like, you know, the focus on three to five years because most people don't uh, think that way. You know, the decisions you make now are going to affect you in three to five years from now. So think of it that way. And, you know, you, you read about, uh, you know, planning. So most people plan week out or month out. You know, the next level up of people, millionaires might think out, you know, quarterly. And billions, billionaires think out like annually. They're Decades. already, yeah, yeah. They're thinking on an annual basis or uh, that further out. So um, I think that makes a lot of sense to to look at some of the consequences or things that are going to happen in the future. But with that, let's say hello to everybody in the crowd here joining us. A couple people we got on here: Nick, Charlotte, Mark Fox. What's up? Um, show sponsor none other than Virtue Health. Go ahead and check us out. New site rolled out. Three, four-step, easy, simple process. Virtue Health, check us out, virtualliance.com. And look out for that broker flywheel coming to you soon. Mm. Um, yeah, practice guide to seeing the future. What do you got, Craig? Yeah, so uh, we'll start off with some easy examples, and we want this to be interactive. So once you kind of get the hang of it, we want you guys to interact with the obvious healthcare-related futures. So let's look at electric vehicles, right? We all know Tesla. <laughs> Tesla's trading at something like, what is it, like 1,200 times revenue? <laughs> Not earnings, right? They just, they've had two quarters of earnings in their history. Like 1,200 times revenue. I mean, it, irrational exuberance comes to mind. So, but what happens? In 2025, I was reading, the automobile marketplace expects to have 400 models of electric vehicles. What kind of pressures does that put on Tesla's stock price? Thinking, you know, am I too late? Am I too early? It doesn't matter. Tesla's, you know, Barnum and Bailey of the 21st century. People are going to invest in whatever he says because he's a, he's just awesome. I don't know. But, you know, so those are the kind of consequences. And then, so what happens when the combustion engine becomes obsolete? Because there's hundreds of electric vehicles. And then, you know, maybe the government sponsors it. Maybe the new president says, hey, we love green. Let's throw out tax credits. And they push it. Combustion engine becomes obsolete. What happens to all of the publicly traded companies that sell parts to cars that have combustion engines? What happens to the mechanics, right? Hmm. Does, do, do, their, do the mechanics become worth more? What happens to auto dealerships? They're not selling old cars anymore. And all their revenue is from service. That's the majority of Service and finance. That's how they make money at auto dealerships. Yeah. And then, so here's another example. Uh, what did I write down here? Oh man, this is a good one. Automobile ownership. So we've got SaaS companies in every imaginable place in business. The average small middle market company has 50 SaaS software as a service vendors, HRIS, payroll, time and attendance, uh, T and E, ERP, CRM. You know, the, the big companies, yeah, sales and marketing have their own uh, the big companies average 15. So 
think of it this way. Automobile ownership. What happens when mobility becomes a service? So mobility is a service. Anybody ever ride Uber? Lyft? It's already started. So what happens between the first generation here? Now, we, we, we've got this COVID, pre-COVID, post-COVID. All those things have slowed down, but this too shall pass. And then what happens as we move into the second consequence of autonomous cars, autonomous trucks, autonomous ships on the ocean? What are going to be the consequences of that? And then so when we're looking downstream, it becomes a really big deal. Will your kids ever get a driver's license if everybody's in an autonomous vehicle and you're playing games or being productive or taking a nap or reading while the car takes you to work or the truck? And every day, every week, every month, you get a new one because there's no more 36-month leases. You know, that stuff goes the way of the dodo bird. Who's going to do that? I, I can have a different car every day. And so you look at all that stuff and you realize – Hey, so if there's a heck of a lot less drivers on it because the autonomous vehicles, what happens to all the parking structures in all the cities? What are they going to do? Now, the forward-thinking companies who are saying that we're literally going to have flying taxis as a service, they're already getting contracts on parking structures. Hmm. Landing on top, getting people, taking them out. So, I mean, there is... Uh, big think tanks going on with what do we do with all of the infrastructure in our major cities? They potentially could be sitting there vacant. So these are the kind of things you start to think about in steps, especially if you're an investor. It's like, maybe, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's too late for Tesla. Maybe it's too late for Ford. Maybe Ford's going to do awesome because their EVs are going to sell like hotcakes. It's something to think about. So let's, let's segue into healthcare. And this is where we want you guys to interact. What do you think's happened to hospitals, right? So we uh, at Catalyze Health have a lot of hospitals as clients. So I'm pretty close to the street there and always am reading about what challenges and issues they have to face so they can have a worthwhile conversation. So there is a major, major fight for what healthcare Carl calls the front door. Who's going to win the battle of the front door for patients? So think about it. First order effect, right, for hospitals. Uh, everyone I talk to, everything I read about, they're all, they all feel like they're, they're six steps behind on virtual care, right? And so now because COVID, I can remember, what is it, 21? 12 years ago, I sold telemedicine on self-funded medical plans. N nobody used this thing. I mean, it had lower utilization than an EAP, and the industry was resistant to use it, and employees were resistant. It was like, that's a new behavior. I like the way I've always done it, the idea of calling. And now COVID's accelerated this stuff five years, ten years. Teladoc has gone, you know, the stock's gone through the roof. I mean, talk about the perfect storm for Teladoc. And so you've got all these hospitals feeling like, oh, my God, how do we get virtual care? And then let's compound that with, oh, yeah, they're, they're – they realize they got a real problem. Hospitals are all sweating. How do we attract retail customers? Especially when you've got Google, got Alphabet, Amazon, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, all competing for their retail customers and no relationships to then segue them if they need a specialist into where? Are they, are they going to your health system? There's no relationships. Are they going to compete with them? We, I've seen different, you know, retail shops. You may have retail shops in your own state where the carrier set it up. Stella's chewing away down here. Uh, and so you've got all of these competitors at the front door of the hospitals and health systems, and they feel terribly threatened and trying to figure out what in the heck do we do to control the patient flow because that's where our money is. If we get to the primary, we'll get to the yeah, specialist, I mean, we'll get to the surgery. Buying, yeah, I mean, that's why they're buying up all the shops and this, that, and the other. It's, it's, it's you know, why are they paying so much for doctors and or, or for, uh, doctor's offices and stuff? It's like, well, their revenue doesn't generate that much to pay them that earn out, but the referrals might, and we can control and get it on the back end. So, yeah, I mean, they're just thinking creative ways to do it, but more competition in the market is always better, 
but you, you have this now. We talk about it with employers is vertical integration of the carriers buying the PBMs, then buying the, the doctor's offices to, to drive the traffic in. And who's doing it now? Uh, United Healthcare just bought another huge... <laughs> Optum's eating the world physician group to control it. And, yeah. you know, it's funny, you know, I know a lot of you guys out there like the DPC stuff and, and that, and I had a conversation with somebody and I said, well, that's great. But what happens when, when United offers them a billion dollars for their organization? Well, they're going to sell. That's, that's what they do. They're going to offer them stupid money that they can't say no to because it's big money to them, but small money to Optum. And that's what happens in the cycle comes over and over. They buy out competitors. So people think that, you know, hey, we're gonna. This is gonna change things, and but what happens is, is they just get bought out in consolidation. So when we talk to employers for a minute, in, in my talk is I talk about what you're up against right now. You're up against consolidation of the ABC House brokerages. You're up against six hundred and seventy nine M and A agencies last year, and about six hundred and fifty the year before that. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. And, and something for advisors, especially independents, to to be wary of. We talk about and. And, you know, the hospital consolidation market, they're all just buying each other, right? Drives up prices, drives up control, bigger. You know, everybody just wants to get bigger to compete with each other, right? And the carriers buying the PBMs, buying the physicians, cost control, and just spreading the profit lines and, and revenue um, lines and buckets or, or what have you through each different pocket. They just figure out the, the M MLR. I mean, come on. They'll just hide it some other place. There's sure. so many different avenues to play it. It's it's what the employers are up against. And these are the conversations we have is it's like, this is what you're up against. You could you could go down that path. Good luck. This is the guy that you trust. But um, if you continue down that path, here's what it's looked like over the past couple of years. And it's only going to get worse. Easy segue into why you should partially self-fund, right? Instead of, you know, partnering and prepaying the carrier who promises to tell you the truth on how much money they're going to need to pay your claims. Yeah, it's back to what you say. If you want an opportunity to win, you can't win here. So no way. for those employers that want to start winning, have a tighter margin, need to do something, they've got to get away from the traditional market. And we talk about... What virtue is, is realignment first. Realignment, regroup, rethink, refocus. But the realignment is you have to align yourself with partners that have the same interest as you going forward. If there's any conflict whatsoever, it's just not going to work. And all those parties that they're partnered with now, everything's against them, right? And it, and I, I tell the story of, um, you know, they have the name brand and they're big and they're bad. But it's like, you know, I learned from Mark. It's like you look at, McDonald's. Who sells the most hamburgers? Yeah. McDonald's. Does that mean it's a good hamburger? Hell no. It just means that they know how to process a, a hamburger speed to the window faster than anybody. Right? Speed. Reminds me of the big box chain store brokerages. They're good at managing benefits and the speed and the process down, but they don't lower your health care costs. Just like McDonald's don't make a good hamburger. I mean, for crying out loud... They made a movie about it Yeah, that basically tells you you can die from eating too much McDonald's, and yet they still sell more hamburgers than anybody. So, you know, that's that's what you're up against. Yeah, you made a good point. I mean, you're either you're a healthcare consultant or you're a healthcare manager. A lot of you are competing against the buyer who buys and likes their relationship with their healthcare manager, and that's a tough thing to, to beat up if they like their manager. And so, you know, if you want a shot at winning, being a consultant and being able to tell these stories and have conversations with them about how the game's rigged against them is obviously going to benefit you, All right? So think about and comment, you know, what are some of these consequences that you guys see? After hospitals, I mean, let's talk about telemedicine. Oh, man, it's, it's, the, it's the hot, it's the beautiful girl at the dance now and so what's the first order consequence well there's awesome. competitors coming out of the woodwork right i mean my god every everybody's into telemedicine now and so so what's what's the next order of problem well how are they going to differentiate and then beyond that what are you going to do when telemedicine's bundled into everything because you know how this industry is 
pretty soon when they prove that something works, it's going to drive down the PEPM on telemedicine. It's going to uh, create fee for service models where, oh no, you don't have to pay, you know, $11.95 PEPM. You'll just pay $82 every time somebody uses it and it'll be self-funded and you only pay as you go. I mean, hell, I, we had that 10 years ago. It wasn't popular because brokers didn't want to sell that. Brokers wanted to make money, so they wanted the PEPM. But as these things mature and accelerate so fast, so much quicker than they used to, I think telemedicine is going to be one of those things. It's going to be, you know, the margin is going to continually, well, it's going to shrink in short order. It may, it may have a real blow up right now because of COVID or to the extent that they keep creating an annual COVID, who knows. Um, but if things ever go back to a, what we would call normal, then uh, I think you're going to see uh, maybe, you know, a blowout on the margin. Then it's just going to shrink from there on out because eventually it'll be bundled into everything. Hey, and when you do this, you get this ID card, you're going to have telemedicine in there. I think Blue Cross in California has been doing it for two years already. It's like, oh, it's already in your rate. How do you sell, you know, nine ninety five a month, to, you know, when it's already in the carrier's rate? See, I mean, they have so much money and can scale so fast and they own 55, 60% of all the physicians. It's just a technology play to do virtual medicine and telemedicine. So just, just build it into the rates and it's hidden and nobody knows what they're paying. And I mean, Aetna can do that. Cigna can do that. United can do that. So if you're thinking you've got this really cool revenue source, I wouldn't count on it for very long. I think the biggest threat and some conversations we had with recently with advisors and, and um, how the flywheel that we talk about plays into it is, is the biggest threat is the sales environment. So we look at the post COVID world. We're in a different sales environment. Okay. We're no longer have the ability to sit in front of a prospect, uh, schmooze them, persuade them, have that personal touch of face to face, right? You guys all get to hear us through podcasts and through YouTube and through Facebook, but there's nothing like face to face. There's nothing like having the high stakes advising event. There's just, there's not replacing that. So we're now at a disadvantage of the sales environment, which we were good at and had the advantage on, right? We understood how to do it, how to build relationships. It's been taken away from us. The question becomes is how long until it goes back to that? Or even worse, does it go back to that? Because let's think about this yeah. for a second. Let's think about this. If I'm an employer and I'm now meeting with vendors over Zoom, and I like it. It's it's less, um, you know, scary or intimidating. Well, why wouldn't I just continue to do them over Zoom? No, 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 don't come in. We'll do it over Zoom. I don't want you coming to my office. I don't want to kick you out. I don't want to deal with you. It makes it harder for me to get rid of you. I don't have to look you in the eye and say no because I don't even have to turn my camera on. Yeah, so, so will they even allow us to come back in? Number one. Number yeah. two, do employers even go back to their office? How many companies are now going 100% virtual? Google, Facebook, Oracle. All these companies have now said, yeah. stay home, work from home. Yeah. Do, do they start hiring now virtually and open up their talent pool and go, this is great. We can hire a talent pool across the country versus based on locale. So maybe that CFO. Or across the globe and they don't need H-1 visas for the workers because they can just work from Bangladesh. Or wherever. Hey, I'm, I'm think about that. I'm that saves them a fortune. I'm, I'm interviewing. We're interviewing somebody from Malaysia who's a superior talent. Works in with my brother in Japan, and he's like, "If I told you what they made, you'd die." And they're they'll probably run over American workers. So yeah, who knows where that person's going to be? It just opens up more opportunities for the employer. Now for us, it's not a good yeah. thing because that CFO, that CEO that we want to get in front of, we now have to sell in a different environment the virtual environment and those that are behind we're behind look most of we had a little me we had edge because we were doing some over zoom ours has been virtual we've been doing this show we're doing video we had a very competitive advantage over people which was great for us but most guys in the independent market don't you see the big box chain stores the peos the payroll companies they've been doing this for years they they've gotten it down already i mean let's go back and remember something guys 
you talk about it, the biggest threat that I saw come in the industry was who? Five years ago. Tech company. All right, Zenefits. Who remembers Zenefits? SaaS company that came in and goes, look at this fat industry. Yeah. Of fat people, uh, people making more money than you should be making, and they're not very good. And they don't know how to market. They don't know how to sell. They don't know how to run meetings. They don't know how to do any of that. They did the whole thing virtually with a sales model because our models, I'm reading and realizing, we're so far behind. We couldn't compete with that. If we had to compete with those SaaS people, we would be destroyed. And what happens next if these people now come into an environment where it's accepted? It wasn't accepted before, right? Right. right. But now the environment has changed. I haven't seen my broker in a year. I haven't seen my broker in 18 months. Well, what? it doesn't matter anymore. He doesn't need to be here. He can be virtual, Right. And it, and it still works. So you're now at threat of these outside parties. So how do we combat that? We have to new, learn the sales system, the, the track record, what steps we need to take, the process. And a lot of us are behind. So selling is now changed and has been disrupted dramatically. Okay. So what's the net effect of this, right? What are the consequences of this, right? We're doing a virtual environment now, but is that, is it going to be there forever? So what are you doing to make changes to this environment? Yeah. And that, and that's not only front facing for you and the client, but, but what, uh, what about open enrollment? What about employees? You know, maybe you start to need, you guys need to learn about chatbots and AI and, you know, all sorts of solutions using technology to scale everything especially customer service because that's what the big companies are doing. That's how they leverage they use technology to scale everything that can be scaled. And that makes you obsolete because it's not an eight to five. It's not a it's not a eight to six PM. It's twenty four seven, three sixty five. The chat bot will answer ninety percent of the questions that people ask virtually. And oh by the way, by two thousand twenty five, seventy six percent of the workforce in America will be millennials. So when you take millennials and then you add Gen Z digitals below them, obviously the super majority of the workers in the workplace. And guess what they don't do? They don't read open enrollment guides. <laughs> they want it in video. They want it in digital. They don't talk on the phone. They don't talk on the phone. They ask They're their peers. They're not going to want to meet in person. They're yeah. going to check you out. They're going to check you out and research you online. Oh, wait, there's nothing about you online? Or you can't, you can't do virtual open enrollment? Now, I'm guessing that most everybody had to learn how to do that this year, but... I'm, I'm sure there's still some guys who are resistant to use that tech thing. Um, you, you have to, or you will be obsolete in three years. I mean, you're going to have to figure out a solution because it's never, it's not going to be the same. I mean, you just look at when Microsoft says, Hey, we, we got, you know, 800,000 employees. We don't think we need to have you come to the office. Like, what? That's really, really big news. Yeah, you had Goldman Sachs that said, we were still able to hit our numbers this year. You told me that, right? We already hit our numbers this year. Well, we don't need to be in expensive New York City. Let's all go down to Florida, no state yeah. tax. We don't need to be here. Best example I can think of. Think about the consequences of this. Disney theme parks. We've all been to Disney, right? I mean, they, the team that wins the Super Bowl, the MVP at the end of the – by the time they leave the television show, the MVP of the Super Bowl says, I'm going to Disney World. Right? I mean, that's what a big deal it is. They're closed all over the globe. It's 24% of the revenue of Disney, and they're closed. Wouldn't you expect that to be an enormous impact, sphincter pucker, on their financials? They had a record year. Well, how the hell did they do that? Because they opened Disney Plus, digital entertainment. They expected that by 2025, they'd have approximately, maybe, at the high end, 64 million subscribers. In 2020, they got 84 million subscribers because of COVID and had a record year. And it didn't matter that the theme parks were closed. Guys, the acceleration and the rate of change is happening so fast that we have to fight remaining relevant in the retail brokerage business. Yeah. I mean, you got to spend some time to think about looking towards the future. And that's what I thought about with 
with selling and marketing now and, and studying some new things and, you know, studying the SaaS model and realizing, holy shit, these guys, it's no wonder these guys scale and grow billion dollar valuation companies so in six quickly. months. Yeah. Because they actually know what they're doing from a sales and prospecting standpoint. And we don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. I mean, uh, it's just, it's, I look back at what we were doing and we were just cold calling with no emails, with no cadences, you know, with no strategic outreach process and classification of leads and steps and no structure. Know, stuff that we're working to now with our, with the marketing, but it's, it's just, mind boggling how far behind we are. So open yourselves up and look at, okay, great. You know, I can study some sales and I think you should still study your sales strategy, but maybe you open your mind up to some other industries that have been doing this from a virtual basis and go, okay, how are they doing it? What are they doing? What steps do they take? How do they qualify their leads? What do they make at the next step? I talked to um, somebody, a buddy of mine that was an accountant. I heard him walk through their step-by-step process in the beginning was just like the consulting is like, look, what we do is we, we give them a, we offer them an analysis or a planning session. It's $2,500. We guarantee that we're, we guarantee you, we find something, we'll give you the money back. Sound familiar? <laughs> so you get to learn a little bit about us before you work with us and we do your returns is what they he's told me. Yeah. So it's exactly Trojan horse before broker record, creating that frictionless and it's all digital. It's all over the phone. They've scaled their whole company that way. They don't meet with people and they even say, Hey, we're a virtual agency and nobody cares. Yeah, guys, it's called a funnel hack, right? If you want to funnel hack any industry, just call them up and act like you're interested, right? You want to see how a really good uh, CFO for hire service works. You call them up and you go, Hey, our agency's considering it. Listen to their pitch, record their pitch. If they're really good, they're going to tell you they sell personal services. We sell personal services. Go to school on somebody else who's really good at it. Payroll companies, my gosh, they're some of the best trained, uh, you know, the big That's ones. That's why I said they've, they've figured this out. They're already, they sell everything. They sell over, hundreds over of clients a year. Yeah, some of these small On a managers. commodity function that people pay premiums for. There, there might be something to learn there. I remember interviewing an account manager one time I worked at ADP. She had like 400 accounts a year. Small group accounts, <laughs> renewals, 400. Nobody talks to 400 people a year in our business. You know, New people? It, it, it's no. like, so, uh, like I said, these are the competitors. I, if it's Zenefits came in now, it, it, it would be, a th- it's a pretty big threat. And, you know, we're going to see as, as these times change what the employer wants because as an independent, think about this for a second, is, is and I always go back to, you know, competing with the ABC houses is – I'm going to give you this away for free. We're going to give you that. we got our five-inch capabilities mm-hmm. binders. we got our farm D, our eight people in the meeting. And how do you compete against that from a revenue standpoint? It's very difficult because they can do it at a scale where they can have a farm D that represents, you know, 50 agents. Whereas as independent, you're not going to do that. Not to say it brings value. It just appears good. It's just another shiny object that people buy and, and, and it appears well. So they're going to be making – investments in technology to give these employers now maybe they didn't know what they maybe they didn't know what they actually wanted and needed and now they're in a position where they're seeing it because of the new world it's now going to be an expectation so how do you combat and the way we've always combated is with outcomes right taking into strategies and solutions where you can actually deliver results and outcomes and lower their health care costs because the big guys say they could do it they just don't do it. it's not their business model and i get it and that's fine yeah um just not their business model. So you've got to have the ability to be able to do that. So generate opportunities, have a sales process down, have the solutions to provide to get the outcomes and retain and constant educate. They're going to want constant education now. Okay. Cause they're getting it from everywhere else. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, share with you. Cause I asked one of the big three, actually one of the big two. I said, so I, I'm really curious. Might be something you guys want to use. I'm really curious what the new initiatives are for your organization, right? It's 2021. We've COVIDed everybody to death in 2020. And so like healthcare brokers, advisors, and consultants do, they were figuring out another angle that had nothing to do with controlling the frequency and severity of claims. Gee, how funny. It was adding to the menu of resources that we can bring to the table with our giant organization, right? But it was actually a good idea. 
And it was, and so I'm going to share it with you guys because you can decide to do something with it or not in your market at your size groups that you talk to, but it was all about leave of absence. Like, you know, we're really focused on PTO, paid time off and, and LOA. And, you know, a lot of employees want to go on vacations, but there's no place to go. You can't fly anywhere. So what are we going to do for our employees? Right. Or, um, just more flexibility in how they design PTO because people need fractional days off because of child care. It's such a mess. The kids can't go to school. And so they're coming up with ideas on um, how to design a, a more user-friendly paid time off and leave of absence rules and policies. So to the extent that you can research that, go to school on whatever the heck these organizations produce, and then sell it to the small and mid-markets that you have as your clients, it might help you. So I'm just sharing that story with you to reinforce, yeah, what do the big box do? Look for another avenue other than giving great health care claims avoidance advice. Yep, shocker. Mark Fox says, how long do you think health care will remain overpriced? Once we fix health care, we have worked ourselves out of a job. I give it 15 years. It's <laughs> a good question. Yeah. As long as they, they have the lobbying power that they do and our political system allows lobbyists to lobby, I'd say never. It's never going to stop. You just saw what so. happened with the election and the corruption and the hypocrisy. And I mean, come on. Well, that's a nice segue. So one of the last items you know, that I wrote down was, okay, so what are the consequences of Biden now being the president? What's his agenda? Right? Well, hell, he advertised Medicare for 60-year-olds. Okay, so uh, it sounds innocuous. Uh, Medicare, I mean, you know, 60, they're old anyways, right? Throw them out. It's American culture, right? Use it, throw it out. Wouldn't be bad. Um, but if you're an insurance carrier, if you're a BUCA and you go, oh, 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 wait a minute, that's 16% of our enrollment, and they have a disproportionately high premium charge in the individual and small group market, we're not letting that money go. But if we're going to be forced to take... 250% less revenue because of Medicare reimbursements. Well, what are we going to do to the commercial payers? I don't know. What do you think they're going to do? Is that going to be inflationary on, on commercial rates? Are they going to cost shift like they've always done for the last 30 years? This Interesting hospital, question. Hospitals are going to charge more. So the, you just make it back. The hospital yeah. lose money on Medicare. On the money, Medicare side, they got a bill on the commercial side. And commercial side, the cost of the commercial insurance is going to be more money to the individual. So, yeah. Like most government intervention, it's going to sound good. It'll be well intentioned, but the consequences will normally be not what they anticipated. It's going to sound good, and it's going to kill 150 million people in commercial products that are under 60, <laughs> as if we're not being killed already. Yeah, you ain't kidding. What else you got? Well, I mean, that's really it. I mean, I, you, you know. Uh, Final thoughts. I think we'll try to get Seth on, right? Because Seth is a, you know, professional pontificator. And uh, see what he thinks about Biden care. He's going he on. The update he's going on. on television all the time. Yeah, he can give us the latest update maybe next week on uh, all of the positions that the the Biden White House has uh, advertised. I guess. Yeah, and if you're listening on the. Uh, the uh, podcast check us out every thursday on the live stream on youtube on facebook and uh, check us out virtualliance.com guys we will see you next week same place same time peace guys be good keep prospecting